Hello, my name's Julian Edgar, and I'm the author of this book, Vehicle Aerodynamics, Testing, Modification and Development. And the book is aimed at those with road cars, those developing racing cars, especially amateur racing cars, and those interested in alternative transport. The topic of today's video is the step-by-step -step process of developing an active rear wing on a hatchback, a road car. Now, if you're expecting this video to be the sort where, you know, I go down to the shop and buy some random wing and stick it on the back and say how wonderful it is, it is nothing like that. It's actually showing the techniques that I cover in the book that allows you to do proper aerodynamic development at low cost and achieve effective outcomes. Let's take a look. So this is the car. It's a Nissan Note Nismo, one of my cars. It's a interesting car. It's a, here in Australia, a grey market import, a Japanese uh, import. Uh, it's a series hybrid, and uh, it's, it's actually got quite good performance, especially when it's only a 1200cc car. Uh, but it hasn't got very good aerodynamics. And uh, in this shot, you can see, for example, the uh, little uh, pizza lid dishes I've added to the wheels to reduce wheel drag. You can see, if you look really closely, the front air curtain. What you can't see is the front curved under tray I've added that provides real downforce. Now, that's the reason for the rear wing. If I increase front downforce, I need to increase rear downforce as well, or it's going to be more prone to high speed oversteer. And you can see here the wing that I am describing in this video. So it's got two aluminium end plates that position the wing behind the car. It's got an aluminium wing, which is a true aerofoil cross section. And it's got this electric actuator that can change the angle of the wing. We'll look at each of the reasons for those aspects in this video. So firstly, the GOE222 True Aerofoil Wing. Now, this is an aluminium extrusion. It's, as the name suggests, based on a, a 1930s uh, aerofoil design, a very, very good one. It's low in drag, much lower in drag than many wings sold for car use, and yet it still develops pretty good downforce. Uh, the aluminium extrusion is available uh, the only one place that I know of in the world, and that's here in Australia. The contact details for the seller are included in my book. And you can also notice, in addition to the aluminium uh, extrusion shape, it's got this little uh, mount inside that's extruded inside, and that's for a 25.4 millimeter spud or one inch uh, spud. You make a threaded spud, slide it into place, and then you've got a mounting point for the wing, which also allows easy adjustment of angle. It's a really, really nice wing, this one. So where to put it? Well, the first step, is to work out what airflow speeds are actually occurring around the car. People talk about putting wings in clean air, but I don't know, I'm not really talking about that. Uh, they're usually talking about not being in turbulence, but I want it in free stream flow. So if the car's doing 100 kilometers an hour forward, 60 miles an hour forward, I want it to be in airflow that's doing that speed. I don't want it to be in lower speed airflow. In other words, I need the wing to be positioned outside of the boundary layer. The boundary layer is the layer of air being partly or fully dragged along with the car, and in the boundary layer, the airflow speed is a lot less than the free stream speed. So I started off measuring airflow speeds using a pitot tube positioned well above the car, in other words, in the free stream flow. Now, a pitot tube sounds complex and expensive. It's neither. Uh, this is one that's sold for use on model aircraft to measure model aircraft speed. Quite cheap, quite a beautifully made little pitot tube. I mount it. I connect two tubes from the pitot tube to a gauge, and I can simply measure the pressure difference by looking at the gauge. And the higher the pressure difference, the faster the airflow speed. So I start off in what is obviously going to be free stream speed, way above the car. And then I gradually lower the pitot tube until I find the point at which the airflow speed starts to decrease. It's no longer the same as free stream speed. And I can achieve that by mounting this with a suction cap, a big good quality suction cap, cap, uh, C-sucker one, and then I gradually move it down the bodywork and obviously lower the height of the pitot tube. So what was found? What was found is that on this car, it's not necessarily the same on your car, the wing needed to be at least 50 millimetres, two inches above the roof line to be in free stream speed. In other words, the boundary layer back here is about two inches thick. 
All right, great, first step. Now, what if I mount it, though, above the bodywork? I started thinking about this, and I started thinking this might not be good. What happens to the pressures, the aerodynamic pressures, on the bodywork under the wing? Now, if the wing is working really effectively, it's going to have lots of high-speed flow on the underside, a low pressure on the underside. Is that low pressure on the underside of the wing going to uh, also cause a low pressure on the bodywork beneath it? And if it does, there's going to be major issues because a low pressure on the bodywork underneath is pulling up and we want the wing to be pushing down and the two are going to be fighting each other and perhaps balancing each other even. So it's not good. So what I made is a, a little mount, two, uh, two mounts, one each end. I taped the mounts to the bodywork temporarily. I've got mounting holes. Here's a screw and a, an Allen key so I can undo the screw and rotate the wing or change its height. Here's a bubble level, and this one's got a little graticule at the end that you can rotate so you can measure the angle of the wing inclination. I just call this a reference angle. And then over here, we have a little pressure measuring patch, which is measuring the pressure, the aerodynamic pressure, on the bodywork under the wing. Now, what I found was that even with the wing at this height, something like this high above the body, it was causing a dramatically lower pressure on the bodywork underneath it. And remember, a low pressure on the roof is trying to pull the car up. We want the wing to be pushing down. If the bodywork's trying to pull up and the wing's trying to push down, the wing's not nearly going to be as effective as it could be. So finding number two, the wing could not be placed close above the bodywork, even at this distance. I mean, if you put it a metre above the bodywork, like we saw with the pitot tube, I'm sure it would have been fine. But, you know, that's obviously a bit impractical and look quite ridiculous. So what did I do? I mounted the wing behind the bodywork. Now you can see I've got plastic end plates here. I later made those out of aluminium, but while I was just temporarily doing it, you can see they're just taped into place. The wing now is behind the bodywork. So the next idea to explore is what is the best angle of attack for that wing? Now, what I did is I actually measured that directly. The wing is mounted on the hatch. It's mounted on the spoiler, which is then mounted on the hatch. And if I were to push down on the wing, the hatch tends to get pushed closed. See what I'm saying? Push down there and that gets pushed that way. So what I did is I put some springs, some compression springs under the hatch rubbers, the little buffers that normally uh, you know, contact the bodywork when the hatch is closed. And that kept the hatch open a little bit. And therefore, as the wing pushed down, the hatch got closed against the force of the springs. To measure how far the hatch got closed, I put a little ruler here, mounted it on a suction cap on the hatch, a little pointer here, mounted on another suction cap, and then a GoPro camera looking at the ruler and the scale. So I could try different angles of attack of the wing and see which gave the best downforce. Now, once you've measured that angle, you've got to subtract a little bit because the, the, the hatch is open and so the angles are changed just slightly, but you can certainly get straight into the ballpark, which gives the best um, downforce, which angle of attack. And what I found is the best wing angle of attack for downforce was minus 15 degrees, a negative 15 degrees to the horizontal. In other words, the back of the wing higher than the front. Now, at that minus 15 degrees angle of attack, you'd expect the airflow to be attached, but was it? So easy to find out. What I've done here is I've used tufts, uh, yarn tufts, in this case woolen tufts, on the bottom of the wing, and I've left them quite long so you can see any fluttering at the end. And uh, this is a screen grab from a GoPro video where I'm driving along, and the flow was just beautifully attached. Like far better than I expected, to be honest. It was just beautifully attached. So the GOE222 profile is just a wonderful profile. Now, if the airflow is attached on the underside of the wing, it's certainly going to be attached on top of the wing. So the other thing you can do is because it's a, a proper aerofoil profile, there are published curves of uh, downforce, or in this case lift on the curves. You just, you just think of it around the other way, uh, versus angle of attack. And when you go and look at those curves for the GOE222, you'll find that minus 15 degrees is well within the, the range of angles, because it's a bit of a plateau, the range of angles where this profile gives good downforce. So it's all made sense, didn't it? So things are looking really good. 
I've got the wing behind the car, I've got the wing um, developing maximum downforce at this angle. Now, how much downforce? What I've done here is I've put a laser height sensor on the side of the car aimed at the road. Now, if the wing develops downforce, the bodywork will get pushed down on the springs and so that sensor will get closer to the road. What I did is I did a run at 130 kilometers an hour. Um, because the suspension is reasonably stiff on this car, you've got to go reasonably fast. I did a run without the wing there. I measured the right height and then I did a run with the wing in position at the right angle, the one we were just describing, and I found the wing developed 19 kilograms of downforce, that's 42 pounds, at 130 kilometers an hour or 80 miles an hour. Okay, that's actually pretty good because the front under tray develops around uh, 20 kilograms of downforce at a slightly slower speed at 100 kilometers an hour. So it would be maybe uh, 25 kilograms of downforce uh, at, at, at a higher speed. So they're, they're pretty well balanced, aren't they? They're not that, that, they're not that far off. And that's really what I wanted. I, I just didn't want all the downforce being added at one end. Okay, things are looking great. All cool, all done. You can see I've made the aluminium end plates all ready to, uh, to hit the road and all finished. But no, because when I hit the road, what I found is that fuel consumption had gone up quite significantly. Mileage had gone down. Now, when I say significantly, I'm talking like 15, 20 percent in, in uh, country driving, you know, 100, 110 kilometer an hour driving. It was obvious on, on the fuel consumption display. So I thought, wow, OK. Now, the wing isn't stalled at that minus 15 degrees. It's got beautifully attached flow. If I go to the curves for that profile, it has very low drag. Its coefficient of drag at that angle is extremely low, so, so that wouldn't be dramatically affecting uh, overall drag. The end plates, yeah, they'll cause a little bit of drag, but gee, not much. What's going on? And then I thought, gee, this wing is so effective at accelerating air underneath it I wonder if it's influencing the pressure in the base area. The base area of the car is the area exposed to the wake. I wonder if it's making a change in pressure there, increasing drag by pulling the car backwards. So I did some measurements. No need to guess. Just go that measuring patch, the gauge, and make some measurements. And this is what I found. Without a wing, the pressure up here was minus 65 pascals at 90 or 100 kilometres an hour. I have to go back and, and look at what speed I did at that. Minus 75 there, minus 72 there, minus 77 there. So you can see the, there's low pressure in the wake below atmospheric, exactly what you'd expect in a wake, and that's pulling back on the car. Okay, what happens when you put the wing into position at that 15 degrees, minus 15 degrees angle of attack? Well, the pressure goes down a long way. Minus 93 from minus 65 to minus 93 minus 75 to minus 102, minus 72 to minus 97, and even down here, look how far beneath the level of the wing that is, minus 77 to minus 95. So, so the pressure drops dramatically in the base area when the wing is at its minus 15 degrees angle, and that explains the whole increase in drag. No need to guess, no need to theorise, we just measure what's actually happening on the road. And the measurements you can see there uh, in that image took me maybe half an hour. It's, it's so quick and so easy. All right, it might be quick and easy, but what do I do about my wing? I'm not going to have a 20% fuel consumption increase, that's for sure. Well, the answer is the wing needs to change in angle depending on how I'm driving the car. So I need a plus eight degrees angle in cruise. How did I work that out? By again, doing more measurements. And I need a minus 12 degrees angle when driving hard. In other words, plus eight means the back of the wing is lower than the front. Obviously minus means it's the other way. Now, what I chose to use is a linear actuator, an electrical linear actuator. And if you look across at this cross-section, cutaway cross-section, you can see it's got a DC electric motor. It drives a gear train, which in turn uh, rotates a lead screw. There's a nylon nut that runs on the lead screw. And as the lead screw rotates, the nylon nut walks along and pushes the rod out the end. Now, these are really cool um, devices to use for anything that needs to be reasonably slowly moved aerodynamically on a car. It wouldn't be any good for an air brake. 
And one reason that they're good to use is because at each end of the travel of the actuator rod, there's a micro switch. So you apply power, the actuator moves out. When it gets to the micro switch, the power gets turned off automatically. So the, the motor is not just fighting the stop. And then when you want to rotate it, make it come back the other way, you simply change the polarity of the feed. Swap the wires, you can do that with a switch or a relay, and then the actuator comes back in and again hits another micro switch and stops. So if you specify the stroke of the actuator to be precisely what's required by your aerodynamic moving surface, you know, 30 millimeter actuator or 50 millimeter actuator or whatever it might be, then you can just use it with a simple switch, a simple switch that flicks the polarity. However, I chose to use a more sophisticated approach. I chose to use this electronic module down here. It's got some major advantages. One is in the software, because it's programmable, I can set plus eight degrees and then minus 12 degrees. So I don't have to get an actuator that just automatically stops at exactly those points. I can stop them before it gets to the micro switch. A huge advantage is you have a potentiometer knob control. So as a driver, you can set the wing to whatever angle you want. One extreme can be plus eight. The other extreme can be minus 12, but you can set it in between positions. And a further major advantage is it's got what's called PID control. Um, and that allows you to do things like have the actuator accelerate smoothly and then as it comes near to the set point that you've set it gradually slows and then reaches that point. So there's not jerks, it's not, you know, ar, 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 ar. it's all nice, smooth and progressive. It works really, really well. It's a, it's a great little programmable module, that one. So how does the car look? Well, in the top pick, we're at uh, the cruise position and uh, low drag. And in the bottom position, we're in the performance position, higher drag, but with real downforce. Now, does the lower drag position have an impact on fuel economy? No, it doesn't anymore. Uh, basically, the drag of the wing in that position, uh, or, or I should say, the, the induced drag, the drag caused by the wing acting on the back of the car, is, is, is makes no difference. And I also measured pressures that showed that. And the end plates, you can't see any difference in, in fuel consumption. But uh, obviously, with the wing up, we now have real downforce occurring. Just an interesting aside, um, I, uh, I fitted this with the control knob so I can, I can change the position. And obviously if I'm driving fast, I rotate the knob. And uh, my wife borrowed the car the other day and I forgot to tell her, it's now got a wing and you know you turn the knob to, uh, to alter the angle. And if I'd thought about it, I probably wouldn't have told her anyway because I didn't expect her to be going fast. But she comes home, uh, we live out in the country, she comes home and says, gee, the wing shakes a lot when you go really fast. And I said, oh, no, did you did you rotate the knob and put it into its uh, high performance position? She said, oh, no, I didn't know I had to. So you can see that uh, with, with the wing down, the airflow either side um, is not going to be developing a force either way. And so the wing is very likely to flutter, aeroelastically flutter. And uh, apparently that's what it does if you go really fast with the wing in its downwards position. Now, I'm never going to have that problem because I rotate the knob and she will now too. Um, but very, very interesting that uh, you could see a difference in behavior of, of that magnitude with the wing in its, its lower position. One of the problems is that because I'm picking up the lower mount on this panel here, that panel is not terribly stiff. And so uh, uh, obviously when the wing is up, everything is loaded. And so there's no movement. But with the wing down uh, at high speed, we now know it, it can flutter a little bit. So what's the outcome? Well, the outcome that I really want to cover in this video is the step-by-step -step process of measurement and decision-making. No guessing, no rules of thumb, no copying what other people are doing, you know, none of that. This is a radically and completely different approach. Measurement on the road with simple and cheap low-cost instruments, making decisions based on those measurements, ending up with a wing that has no apparent drag penalty. It might have a tiny one, but it's not measurable in, in fuel economy and yet creates real downforce. And you might say, well, does this make the car different? You betcha it does. With the front under tray and the rear wing in its raised position on uh, a series of, of S-bends taken you know, reasonably quickly, the car is absolutely planted. 
it, it doesn't behave that way on, on slow corners, low speed corners, like a really tight hairpin because the aero is not working anymore. But uh, as you go faster, the car becomes more and more stable, more and more planted, and more and more grip. Uh, these things are, are readily um, identifiable by the driver. You know, it's, it's, it's now um, clearly uh, better at, at speed. The other day I was driving on the freeway, um, gusty crosswinds. Normally, of course, I have the wing in its low position, its low drag position. But I was just, we just getting moved around a little bit by the wind and I thought that would be interesting. I might just rotate the knob a little bit until I can feel the car becoming a fraction more stable without having the fuel, uh, full fuel drag penalty. And yeah, the wing came up a little bit and the car did become more stable. And that's the advantage of having this infinite control with the knob. You can actually change uh, the position to, to whatever you want. You know, it doesn't have to be either one end or the other end. Incidentally, this little uh, little uh, stripe uh, you can see is is smaller here than it is here and I can see that in the rear vision mirror so it's very easy to know what angle you have the wing at even even if you're not looking at the knob um, you just look in the mirror and you can see by the, the the size of that stripe what angle it's in the book's called vehicle aerodynamics testing modification and development it covers all of these sorts of techniques it covers the the development of the uh, Nissan's wing in more detail than I have here but the key thing to take away from this video is you don't have to guess. If you're doing aerodynamic development on any type of vehicle, you can measure what's going on and then you can make decisions that actually reflect those measurements. And once you've done that, this, this approach that so many people taking of copying and guessing and random stuff just looks absolutely ridiculous. The book's available from Amazon in your country. It's not a particularly cheap book. It's 500 pages, an inch thick, uh, 800 uh, full color um, photos, diagrams, graphs, 175,000 words. Uh, and so it's not gonna be cheap at uh, those sort of print costs. But the very first time you make a measurement and then take some action on your car that actually works, you'll think, well, the cost of the book was, was well worth it. Ah! There's a beep. I've got to go. Thank you. Bye-bye.